The Man Who Saw Infinity is a by-the-numbers biopic, but it has a lot to say. Unfortunately, by following the standard Hollywood formula, the inaccuracies add up. Every variable in that formula could have been changed for accuracy to make this a better film, but the spirit of the man depicted is still within its form. The movie is about the extraordinary Indian mathematician Srinivasa Ramanujan. It is inaccurate in some places, but not irredeemably so. I think this film deserves far more attention than it has thus far. Ramanujan came from Madras, India, now called Tamil Nadu. He became a Brahmin, which means he was very religious and a strict vegetarian. He had a gift with math and began writing his findings down. He did not have any formal training, only a rudimentary knowledge of notation. Impressive. If Sir Francis comes here, at least pretend to use this. In the tradition of his family, he was part of an arranged marriage at the age of 22 in 1909. I am Ramanujan. And I am your wife. He began to be noticed by local mathematicians who started to recommend him elsewhere. After being denied by some British professors, his brilliance was recognized by a mathematician at Cambridge named G. H. Hardy. Cambridge University brought Ramanujan to England and enrolled him in some classes in 1914, just prior to World War I. He worked with Hardy on further mathematical research of all kinds. They made a significant pairing since Ramanujan's work was based on his intuition while Hardy was married to procedure. What an unlikely team we make. Yes, but intuition is not enough. It has to be held accountable. They had their differences. For instance, Hardy was an atheist, but they did great things together. No, I, I can't believe in God. I don't believe in the immemorial wisdom of the East, but I do believe in you. I won't go into the specific theoretical math that these guys did, after all, I went into history, not math, but the movie explains at least one of these things quite well. This even you could understand. P of 4 equals 5. Now all that means is there are 5 ways to add up the number 4. 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, 3 plus 1, 2 plus 1 plus 1, 2 plus 2, Four. But when you raise the number of P to 100, there are 204,226 different combinations. Now he thinks he can figure out a formula, plug in the number, any number, and out comes the number of partitions like magic. But there is so much more to Ramanujan's accomplishments that cannot be enumerated here or in the movie. Hardy. Uh, this will take a lifetime. Maybe two. He was undoubtedly a genius. Due to his research, he was awarded an honorary Bachelor's of Science in 1916. He continued to do research, and in 1917, some of his work was initially published. Eventually, he was awarded a fellowship with the Royal Society in 1918, the first Indian to be elected for it since 1841. Later that year, he was given a fellowship at Cambridge Trinity College. In 1917, he had been diagnosed with tuberculosis. It's not good. You have all the early signs of tubercular. His refusal to eat the food served by Cambridge on behalf of the Brahmin belief in vegetarianism exacerbated the problem. Stop. He's a vegetarian. Potatoes, sir. How's that any better? The potatoes are cooked in lard. By the end of World War I, Ramanujan was beginning to seriously show his sickness. He also was coming to the realization that many of his ideas from back in India were simply retreading things that Europeans had done decades if not centuries ago, despite him coming to them independently. Some of these things took their toll and Ramanujan attempted suicide. He managed to make it into 1919 when he headed back to India. While convalescing there, he continued to research mathematics and kept a notebook. He died in 1920 from the tuberculosis at the age of 35. His final notebook was lost until 1976, and all of his research remains a subject of intense inquiry to this day. Ramanujan's contributions to mathematics have continued well after his death.
It is difficult to put into words what I owe Ramanujan. His originality has been a constant source of suggestion to me ever since I first met him. This film generally gets the idea of Ramanujan. It comes close to worshipping him. The man exceeds any notion of brilliance that I have ever understood. Forget Jacobi. We can compare him with Newton. I have come to believe that for Ramanujan, every single positive integer is one of his personal friends. But it does have some powerful things to show about the man's life. We're challenged with the way that he came to be such an autodidact. He gives his religion as an explanation. Don't you see? An equation has no meaning to me unless it expresses a thought of God. But this movie does not require us to believe in him. One definitely gets a sense of how important Ramanujan was to the history of mathematics. His brilliance in the subject was an inspiration to all who met him. The film even breathes life into the most repeated anecdote about the man. The cab driver got lost. Should have known from his number. For a dull one. 1729. It is a very interesting number. It is the smallest number expressible as the sum of two cubes in two different ways. We also get to see the clash of cultures and the connotations that had in the early 20th century in England. This movie doesn't explicitly make all Indians into some sort of backwards people needing civilization, nor does it make the British into wholly racist individuals. It shows some of this for both, with Ramanujan's mother forbidding him to do things due to their caste, Karnavia Brahmins, it is forbidden to cross the seas, and with Ramanujan constantly having to push through racism in England. Freeloading little blackie. Hey. Now, there's no evidence to support either of these plot details, but it is quite conceivable that could have happened without any evidence being produced. Plus, they serve to illustrate the era quite well. And there is so much more of this stuff. It gives us a rare view in academia during World War I, or any major war for that matter. Cambridge was heavily involved in the war effort, so we get to see the medical tents in the quad, professors going off to fulfill functions during the war, Bertrand Russell getting fired for being an open pacifist, and faculty dealing with the deaths of their students. All the knowledge they gained here, sacrificed for a few yards of lamb. They say it's the price of victory. Hmm? They even depict a Zeppelin attack with Ramanujan witnessing a victim of the bombing. It's great stuff. Really, the main problem with this movie is that it gets the timeline all mixed up. You never really get a sense of when things are happening. World War I starts, but never seems to come to an end. Nor do we have any way of knowing how far apart in time the events in this movie are. It's legitimately confusing, and I already researched it before watching. They could have broken the whole formulaic Hollywood biopic problem by simply allowing us to see some dates in the corner of the screen or something along those lines. Otherwise, the problems are fairly minor story-wise. Both Hardy and Ramanujan's wife were substantially younger than are depicted. But I think that doesn't affect the plot, and allows the filmmakers to not have to explain why such a young girl is getting married or a professor of such close age is acting so paternal. Because a lot of people aren't familiar with the nuances of Indian marriage practices or student-professor relations. This may outrage some folks, though, when they learn that Ramanujan married a 10-year-old girl and that Hardy was only 6 years older than Ramanujan. I don't think that really matters, though. Besides confusing dating and whatnot, they do not depict Ramanujan graduating with his BS degree, which we even have pictures of. They also emphasize his denial for fellowship in 1917, but do not acknowledge that that was because of him being unpublished. Nor do they show him getting that very fellowship a year later. They come close to implying that it was racially motivated, if you think I'm going to have that charlatan for a fellow, you're very much mistaken. And that's probably not the case. For the most part, Ramanujan never openly complained about British racism against him. 
He was living in Cambridge after all, so Indian students were not altogether a rarity. This movie shows some other Indians there, but not as much as reality. Ramanujan wasn't even the first Indian fellow of the Royal Society. So, while he may have experienced racism, he lived in a place that was exceptionally forward-thinking. Besides, these scenes don't hinder the plot so much as show us the problems of British rule for even the exceptional. If it weren't for the plot being all jumbled up in the Hollywood formula, this movie would be a good historical flick. I think it's worth watching because you do come to understand the prowess of this man and his endearing story.